All right, hello and welcome to part one of the unit two uh, lecture. So you're gonna wanna take notes um, while you're watching these videos. There's gonna be five videos total, five parts. Um, for this part one, we are specifically going to do the introduction to biodiversity. We will look at ecosystem services in part two and then island biogeography, island biogeography uh, ecological tolerance, natural adaptation, uh, natural disruptions to ecosystems in video three. Uh, we'll look at adaptations in video four, and then ecological succession in video five. So, we will start part one, talking about biodiversity. Essentially, biodiversity is talking about the vast amount of different species and different. Um, living things on earth right it's typically considered to be in place because of the different biomes so um, you get a definition of what a species is essentially a species is just a set of individuals that can mate and produce fertile offspring the key being fertile um, if two species can mate and produce offspring that's not fertile they are not considered to be the same species um, so right now about eight to a hundred million species exist on earth that's the estimate um, that is closer most scientists will say somewhere in the 20 million range we've identified two million species and um, for the most part most of the unidentified species are going to be found in rainforests almost every day a new species is found in the rainforest as well as in the oceans the big reason we haven't found a lot of those species in the oceans and why we estimate there are so many is because we've just um, haven't discovered a lot of things in the ocean. We haven't explored the ocean as vastly as we have the rest of the world. So different types of di uh, biodiversity. The first is the genetic biodiversity. So this is the idea that you have different genes in the population, right? Um, the idea being that the more genetically diverse the population is, the better it's gonna respond. So if an entire population is very genetically similar and a virus comes in comes into contact with that population because they are so genetically similar if they happen to have a weakness to that virus it is going to wipe out the population very quickly whereas if you have a very genetically diverse population you have the ability to have certain mutations and certain genetic differences that are actually going to allow that species to overcome whatever disruption is in place so you know there are certain species that have a genetic diversity where certain members of that population can withstand higher temperatures which is going to benefit them in with with uh, climate change um, population bottleneck can also lead to a genetic diversity the idea of a population um, bottleneck is that you have a large amount of population growing so you can think of population as something like the population growing uh, somewhat exponentially and then maybe it starts to balance and then it sharply declines this decline is going to cause the loss of genetic diversity because a lot of the different genes that are in that population are going to actually uh, go away and that's going to cause less genetic diversity um, there's also species biodiversity so Species biodiversity, essentially, we have many different species of, in this one, um, butterflies, winged, winged insects, essentially. These are all different species. There are a variety of them, but they are very similar, okay? Um, there's two types of major types of species. We're looking at generalist, where they have a broad niche, which is a wide range of tolerance, and we'll look at a... Um, a graphic on that and then a specialist species where it has a very narrow niche um, a niche is or niche as some people will say um, is basically the tolerance or the range of tolerance that a species has uh, you would you would classify a niche or niche by a species of what food it eats where what type of ecosystem it can survive in the temperatures that it can can tolerate um, so you get generalist species are able to you know eat many different things right so if you have a deer that is a generalist species of deer that can eat multiple types of um, you know flora 
that deer is going to do better than say a specialist deer so a different species of that deer that maybe only eats one specific type of, of sagebrush for instance and so the big thing here is that if you have loss of habitat which we as humans are causing a lot of the specialist species is going to be the first to go because it has such a short small range of tolerance so this is an example of a specialist versus a generalist a panda for instance has a very narrow niche right a very narrow niche um, you know your your typical pandas can eat you know they eat bamboo they live in a certain type of rainforest they have to specifically mate in a certain way and they have a very um, long mating period whereas say a raccoon <laughs> has a very broad niche or niche um, I'm going to say niche or niche because I know some of you have different uh, beliefs on how that should be sound, how that should sound. So the idea here is that this is going to be a broad niche, broad niche. So if some of these, if some of the factors that affect that species start to go away, it still has some room to move around. And then the region of niche over overlap or niche overlap, this is where competition happens. So this is where you're going to get these two species competing and obviously the specialist species is going to be harmed more than the generalist species with competition. Um, some examples of a bird species in a coastal wetland, you have many different bird species that have very specific niches on the coast. So you're going to actually see some species of birds will actually go out farther, whereas some specifically need to eat close to shore, some actually eat right on the beach, so this is where their tolerances are very, very specific. So you can imagine that if, the, if this water began to become polluted um, and say it was being polluted only out in the wider areas out here, that pollution is going to affect these species with that very narrow niche or niche. So some different types of species again. There's native species versus non-native species. A native species is a species that normally lives in that ecosystem, whereas a non-native is typically introduced. Um, it can be an invasive species. One of the cool graphics that you can find on this is that you know native species have really intricate and long root systems because they've been there much longer, whereas non-native species typically have very short roots because they're going to have not been around for as long and not have the need for as uh, complex of a root system. So non-natives really can be considered invasive and we do s usually see invasive species are always non-native species, but we don't always see non-native species being invasive. There are some non-native species that aren't invasive. Um, another categorization of different species, we have indicator species like the frogs, uh, different amphibians are really highly considered an indicator species. They give an early warning when there's a community being endangered. So as you guys are reading the sixth extinction, you see that because there are a number of frogs and amphibians that are starting to go extinct, it is an indication that something is happening. And so you can actually monitor environmental quality by looking at their health. If their health is low, it is telling you that something is going on, something big is about to happen because they're a species that typically gives away like oh hey this species is going extinct which means there are probably other species that are interest uh, being introduced to that problem and then a keystone species is the species that has a huge effect on the types and abundances of other species um, these species can have po be pollinators they can be predators uh, starfish for instance are a keystone species and the idea is if you took this species out of an, a um, food chain or a food web the keystone species the food chain or the food web would collapse because they almost every other species relies on this species to maintain the population we'll talk about or actually you, you'll read in the in the textbook about the otter population with um, underwater forests of plant of um, kelp kelp forests and as and, and there's different species of um i want to say oh i can't remember the name of the species that's eating it's it's wiping out the kelp which is hurting um 
they're eat, overeating the kelp, but that species is actually uh, mollusks. I think it was mollusks. Um, but they're beginning to overpopulate because of the low number of sea otters. And as humans are killing sea otters, um, the population of the, uh, the kelp is actually going down. These kelp forests are starting to die because the sea otters were keeping the mollusks in check. The mollusks couldn't eat too much of the kelp forest. Now that the sea otters are gone, kelp forest is being eaten too much. And now other species that use that as their habitat are dying off. And so... Um, we'll look at some other examples of keystone species and how important they are to an environment and how they are important they are to an ecosystem. So uh, some of the types, other types of biodiversity. So remember, we were talking about genetic. We talked about species. We also have habitat biodiversity, which is all of the different biomes, different types of habitats. Um, typically, if you have a biome or an ecosystem that has a lot of species, it will recover better because there is a lot more diversity. If there's not a lot of diversity in a habitat, if something bad happens to that habitat, there are less species to help repopulate um, because essentially you can think of it when habitats are harmed, if you have a, a lot of uh, specialist species, those species when they are wiped out are gonna be gone forever. Whereas if you have a multitude of different species, the likelihood of a rebound is much greater. And then this is just a, a really good term to know, species richness, um, and then species evenness is another term. So species richness is just looking at the different types of species, so a lot of different species. So you can see in this image below, both of these communities actually have the same species richness. They, all, they each have four different types of these trees. Um, the species evenness is how even those species are in that given area. So you can see in community one, there's 25% of each. So it's a very species even population. Whereas community two has a lot of the, uh, the third type and not as much of the other three. So it's not very species even, even though it has species richness. If you have a thousand species in one ecosystem and maybe it's one of everything and then you know, one of 999 of those species and then one species that has like a million. That still has the same species richness, but it's not very species even. So that'll be the end of part one. You can uh, head on to the next video to watch part two when you're ready and learn a little bit more.